Good evening, everyone. We're gathered here to talk about the future. And those of us in the technology industry, I guess you could say we're hardwired to think that technology and innovation can lead to a better world. But today, as the opening sequence of that video plainly shows, there are some dark clouds on the horizon. And they represent challenges and threats to our worldview and our way of life, and it demands a response. Right here in Munich on New Year's Eve, authorities stopped celebrations, closed down the Central Railway Station, and this was in response to intelligence that terrorists were planning to detonate suicide bombs in the passenger terminals. Not far away in Brussels, police arrested suspects, allegedly planning attacks leading to the cancellation of all public celebrations. And a little further on, Paris, still under a state of emergency since the terror attacks on the 13th of November, scaled back celebrations and deployed 11,000 troops on the streets to protect its citizens. On the same day, another grotesque propaganda video appeared online depicting the execution of five innocent men while a masked murderer speaking with a British accent made threats against the UK with a four-year-old boy by his side, that same four-year-old boy you saw in the video. With more deadly attacks this past week, Burkina Faso, Pakistan, Cameroon, Istanbul, Jakarta, 2016 has had an ominous start indeed. But there's nothing inevitable about what happens next. There are things that we can do, and the future is there to be shaped. And I believe that a part of that future is in the hands of every one of you. What links all these events together is the threat from terrorist and extremist groups like Daesh, or the so-called Islamic State. Their threat is both physical and psychological. On one hand, Daesh presents a very physical danger to the safety of our citizens. But terrorism, as you know, is not just about a threat to life. Terrorists aim to undermine our very way of life. So in the physical world, we respond as we must. Governments act. The police and security services do their work. They uncover plots, they marginalize the forces of extremism in the communities, and they keep people safe from harm. We've seen similar threats, and we faced them down before. In fact, seven potentially deadly attacks were stopped in the UK last year alone. <laughs> but there is a new dynamic to this threat in the digital age that demands a new kind of response. In free and democratic societies, even the worst bigots are entitled to their opinions. But today, the internet gives them a platform to take their hateful messages and violent provocations to millions, and often they do so anonymously, without fear of reprisal. The very idea of the internet, that great force for good, designed to bring people together and advance understanding, is being undermined by them. It's becoming an echo chamber of hate, fear-mongering, and intolerance. And groups like Daesh are masters of the craft. They have been quick to understand the power of the web, to recognize the ability to give them reach and impact that was previously impossible. They exploit its scale to reach directly into the lives and minds of millions of people in their communities and in the privacy of their own homes. And while airstrikes are degrading their positions in Iraq and Syria, Daesh are fighting a second war for the hearts and minds of the next generation, spreading their warped worldview. They understand their audience, their grievances, and how to exploit them. And they typically prey on the young, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. Often still in school, some are persuaded to leave their families to pursue an apocalyptic dream or take action that threatens safety and security at home. The generation most at risk is the first generation to grow up more technologically literate than their parents and their teachers. They live almost their entire lives connected to their devices. This leaves them open and susceptible to influences online when they're not monitored or supervised, open to opinions in the uncontested space. 
And the perpetrators of this counterinsurgency are often from the same peer group. They're digital natives, they're social media experts, they're coders, attracted by the group's perverted ideology. And they understand the language of propaganda and impressionable use of their target consumer. Their narrative is powerful, straightforward, and simple. You are one of us. Irrespective of where you come from, join us and claim your place in history. Producing Hollywood-style recruitment films that glorify violence and with CGI game quality to add excitement and interest, their propaganda romanticize a life that bears no resemblance to the hell that exists on the ground. If you forgive me, I'd like to pause for a moment and just to give you a view of one minute of an ISIL video that was released in November 2015. And my apology in advance if it's hard to watch, but I think it's important to understand. This is our Khilafa in all its glory, remaining and expanding. It was established in the year 1435 Hijri. Its leader from the tribe of Quraysh is Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and its territory is already greater than Britain, eight times the size of Belgium and 30 times the size of Qatar. It's a state built on the prophetic methodology, striving to follow the Quran and Sunnah, not a secular state built on man-made laws whose soldiers fight for the interests of Bahut legislators, liars, fornicators, corporations, and for the freedoms of Saudis. We are men honored with Islam who climbed its peaks to perform jihad, answering the call to unite under one flag. This is the source of our glory, our obedience to our Lord. As you can see, I'm sure many of you have never seen that video before, and the first time I saw it, I was absolutely shocked. As you can see, the propaganda is professionally produced, and today, Daesh produced these materials in 20 different languages, in 36 different official media houses in the region, which were mostly Iraqi and Syrian abandoned television stations, which they're using to great advantage. They have a central marketing arm that creates a steady stream of video and propaganda materials, all of which are approved by a central command. And they have a concerted effort to ensure, if you see, all the branding is consistent, using the same taglines, messages, music, and symbols, and of course, the Daesh flag. They understand the marketing funnel as well, starting with mass communications that grab the world's attention, then disseminating that message on social platforms using highly targeted techniques for specific audiences, luring them in. With a sophisticated strategy and a ready arm of online volunteers, they put their plans into action. They maximize their reach using social media tactics and automated technology like bots to gain followers and give the impression that they are stronger than they are that their messages of hate and intolerance have more supporters than they do. And unlike in the physical world where national governments can take clear and firm aim to protect people and keep them safe, there's no such obvious solutions online. There are no borders or boundaries on our products and platforms. And these guys have resilience as well. They operate a dispersed network of accounts that constantly reconfigure in response to takedowns and account suspensions. They use swarm casting to allow groups of radical sympathizers to rapidly and automatically respond and reorganize their communications to ensure a near consistent presence of their message on social media platforms. J.M. Berger from the Brookings Institution in his ISIS Twitter census, he estimated that an average of 200,000 Daesh supporting tweets are posted every day. One of Daesh's horrific murder videos was reported to have been viewed 150,000 times in 48 hours. Knowing all this, and knowing all the talent that's in this room, we can't sit by and be silent witnesses. As British philosopher Edmund Burke said, that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Many people are working very hard on this problem in the technology industry, but I'm afraid it's time to respond on an entirely new level, with a cohesive, committed, and coordinated response. To reclaim the platforms, products, and applications we love and use every day from those who exploit freedom of expression and openness to incite violence and push dogma and repression. 
While Daesh and others seek to undermine the very ideals and values that the internet was established to advance, we must reinforce its capacity to be the answer to hatred and intolerance rather than a vehicle for it. If governments continue to approach this fight alone as nation states, each country effectively reinvents the same strategies and tries to attack the, the enemy from within their territory, when in fact their products and platforms reach across boundaries of all nations. But the good news is that we can all work together. You have the expertise that's needed, the marketers, the data scientists, the developers, the deep understanding of machine learning. And it's the right thing to do. Because when the internet stops being an undisputed force for good, the business models that rely on it can be called into question, and brands can be irreparably damaged. I realize that this is not something we want to focus on when we're here to talk about pondering a bright future. But I must say, in my capacity as the UK's Minister for Internet Safety, we honestly can't avoid it. There are voices out there who try to reduce the problem to an extreme edge case, and thus implying that any action is an overreaction. If that were true, I would be very pleased, but unfortunately, it's not. And the mentality of that is dangerous. It ignores the reality and the scale of complexity we all face. Yes, at the sharp end of the problem, the point where people move from radical sympathizers to action involves a very small number of people and is rightly the domain of law enforcement agencies and governments. But radicalization is a journey. It starts with one connection, and it often starts right out in the open. We need to stop the messages that foster hate, that incite violence at source, before their toxic arguments can take hold and draw more vulnerable people in. The argument has also been made that closing out extremists in the open web will drive them to dark, encrypted places. I don't think it's a question of either or. For the more advanced and dangerous conversations, I, I suspect it's true already. But long before people leave open platforms for private conversations, they discover this pro propaganda in the open web. And this is where we can have the most impact. We can stop more people from being exposed. Facebook recently commissioned a study in the UK by a think tank called Demos. It's an excellent study, and I recommend you read it. But it concluded that not enough is being done to promote counter speech. It suggested that government should support civil society to develop more counter speech programs and give them a platform and a greater share of voice. Well, we in the British government couldn't agree more, and we're already doing this, a huge amount of it. We are bringing communications experts, civil society groups, and others together to develop and run targeted and effective counter campaigns. We've committed a significant expansion of this program through the, Brit the British government's new counter-extremism strategy. But we can't do it alone. We need industry to match that connection. The tech community has always come together in times of need. And right now, in Paris, a very special hackathon is underway. Sponsored by the mayor of Paris and the police, hundreds of developers are working through the weekend on five challenges ranging from how to prevent radicalization in communities, how to stop dissemination of hate speech, how to strengthen emergency procedures, or better process the statements of witnesses and victims, and disseminate information to the public in times of crisis. Another great example recently happened in the UK and actually around the world. It's called TechFugees. It was created by the CEO of TechCrunch Europe, Mike Butcher. Tech, he's here. <laughs> TechFugees is working with the UN Human Rights Council in sponsoring global hackathons to develop practical solutions to the migrant crisis. This is another example of the tech community coming together to turn their attention and expertise to this most significant human challenge. Coordinated industry action like this represents a great opportunity to make impact in innovative ways. Take the problem of child sexual exploitation online We've seen unprecedented industry cooperation to rid the internet of this vile crime. Prime Minister David Cameron um, created the We Protect initiative, and now we have over 60 governments, tech companies, and NGOs committed to the fight to eradicate child sexual abuse and exploitation online. 
Google and Microsoft have worked to rid all, all but rid the internet of pathways to illegal child sexual abuse images and search. And the US and the UK government and NGOs work with the Internet Watch Foundation so that illegal abuse, tech, illegal abuse images known to law enforcement can be given digital identifiers and that facilitates their removal from platforms and services. Whilst recognizing that these two problems are different and that the laws vary from country to country, we can certainly learn from this experience. In regards to terrorist and extremist content, more needs to be done. We need your ideas, but to start things off, here are a few suggestions that we believe will have immediate and positive effect. First, we need you to help community and civil society groups to create, deliver, and amplify alternative content that undercut, undercuts the Daesh brand. Companies with online advertising business models are best positioned to develop effective campaigns that reach and extend the reach of these counter speech initiatives. We need your best ex experts to counteract these hateful, manipulative myths and propaganda. Second, we need your support of established government partnership organizations that cooperate to combat online extremism. The EU Commission's Internet Forum and the Global Coalition Communication Cell, based in the UK Foreign Office, draw on the expertise and resource of 63 participating countries. And this is an example of governments working together across borders to scale the response. Third, we need innovative industry, industry solutions that scale the identification and removal of terrorist content to develop more mass takedown efforts that will make these message networks harder for terrorists to reconfigure. We also need to better tackle automated bots and other techniques that support the propaganda machine. They manipulate free speech and construe a narrow view to resemble that of the majority. Working together with industry, in 2015, the UK's Counterterrorism and Internet Referral Unit removed 55,000 pieces of terrorist and extremist content that violated companies' terms and conditions. Based on this model, the EU Internet Referral Unit was launched, and up until now, this launched in July, and they've already been seeing that 90% of the referrals they make to industry have been taken, taken down. Last year, YouTube removed 14 million videos, and in April last year, Twitter suspended 10,000 Daesh accounts. Following the Paris attacks, Telegram swiftly acted to suspend the accounts of 78 public channels used by Daesh and their supporters in 12 languages. So you see, companies already do a great deal to challenge terrorism and extremism. But responding to these evolving and sophisticated threats requires constant iteration and unprecedented cooperation. Governments and industry should apply the learnings from working with the Internet Watch Foundation and create an industry body or forum like the IWF to share known tactics of extremist groups online and develop strategies to combat them. Fourth, please consider the danger of, of terrorist and extremist propaganda when developing products alongside of other Internet harms when you're, when you're building these products so they become safe by design. There is one internet now for everyone, every age, but sometimes we need to make special provisions for young people. A great example is what YouTube have done recently with the launch of YouTube Kids. We also need companies to support education projects aimed at building digital resilience to get young people thinking critically about what they see online and help them make informed and safe choices. Together with online safety charities, you can increase awareness, confidence, and the capability of parents and teachers. And finally, it's imperative that we empower the user community with better tools to respond, to report, and take down harmful content. Every person has the ability to recognize bias, hatred, intolerance, and to take action and say, no, not on my profile, not on this product that I love and that I use every day. It's often said that technology products heal themselves and that members act to root out those who seek to, seek to abuse the atmosphere and damage it. And often hateful and cruel content results in more people denouncing it than supporting it. 
but we must make sure that people have the tools to do so and they're empowered to use them. These are just a few ideas. My, my real appeal, though, to all of you here today is to make this agenda your own. I believe that freedom of expression and freedom from harm are two ideals that can exist side by side. Let's turn our ideas and our creativity against the terrorists and extremists. We can't allow them to exploit something that was developed to bring the world closer together and use it to drive us apart. To paraphrase Jared Cohen from Google Ideas in his recent Foreign Affairs article, it will take a broad coalition to marginalize the Islamic State online. We need to first target its central command before digital society at large can come together and push the remaining rake and file into the digital equivalent of a remote cave. That must be our ambition. We can't let the world retreat to a place of ignorance and prejudice. We must stand up for what we believe in. Freedom, peace, democracy, understanding, inclusivity. A world in which knowledge, debate, and discussion bring people closer together and make them feel part of something that's greater than themselves. The technology that was de developed to unite us must not divide us. Thank you.